All right, everyone, we are back for another exciting session of Operation Optimize in pursuit of workflow optimization and sterile processing. I am super excited that you all chose to spend your Friday with us. You could have done a whole host of other things and yet you're here taking in all of this content. Um, please know that all of these sessions today will be available on demand. So if you or your colleagues have to scoot early um, or if there's something that just really hit home for you today that you wanna share with your department leaders, with your colleagues in the hospital, you can. And so that's a beautiful thing about these virtual conferences is this content will live on and will be accessible to you and for you um, for a long time to come. I am really honored to host this session today. I wanna to give a huge thank you to our event sponsor, Gettinga, and also for our collaborating organization, First Case Media, for offering, offering nursing event, or nursing CEs for today's event. A quick reminder that each session is individually approved for sterile processing credit. So at the end of each session, you'll find the link in the resources window um, to access your CE certificate. Nurses, at the end of this event, if you're still tuned in, you'll be automatically directed for your nursing credit uh, at the end of the conference. Today, we are going to be talking about something that I get really excited about because honestly, I don't know a lot about it, but when I have these types of conversations and when I listen to conversations about sterile processing department design, something in my brain chemistry is like, wow, this is important, this is interesting, and this can change the way that workflow optimization happens in the SPD. I am pumped to have two experts on this topic joining me today, Shane Pinkston and Jeff Bleeker. I'm not gonna introduce them for you. I'm gonna allow them to do that themselves. They know themselves best. And I'm super excited for you guys to get to know them as well. So Shane, why don't I turn it over to you first? Thanks, Lindsay. And hopefully uh, you can hear me here um, up from the, the great white north in Wisconsin. Um, so from my background, I, I'm actually the senior product manager for getting up for infection control for the United States. And I have been in just about every role in the industry, I think, for the past uh, 29 years. I'm working on my 30th year in sterile processing. So whether that was uh, servicing the equipment, installing it, uh, selling it, uh, designing departments, selling software, um, helping customers on a consulting basis, I've uh, kind of been doing it for a while. So glad to be here. Jeff, how about glad yourself? Glad to have you. Thanks, thanks for having us. I'm Jeff Leaker, and um, I uh, currently are, work for Gettingo. I'm their healthcare planning and design manager. I cover the Western half of the United States, mainly focusing on IC um, products, uh, sterile processing and, and design. Uh, prior to that, I worked for one of our competitors for uh, seven years, and prior, I've done uh, medical equipment planning. So I've planned ORs, I've done SPDs, med surge, you name it, um, we've uh, I planned it. So welcome to be here and looking forward to having a great discussion. Awesome, awesome. Thank you both for joining me today. Um, in the context of sterile processing, department design is critical. It sets sterile processing professionals up for success in their ability to effectively and efficiently do what they need to do to prepare instrumentation. And it can also inhibit that success. And so we're gonna talk about the evolution of department design today. We're gonna to talk about the do's and the don'ts. We're gonna have a really in-depth discussion about this topic and I'm really, really excited. I'm actually gonna send this first question over to Jeff. Jeff, can you give us, just to set the stage a little and provide a little bit of context, can you sort of shed light on a historical perspective, how design considerations in the sterile processing department and maybe in the hospital in general, if we wanna get broad a little bit, how those have evolved over time and where in history you start with this discussion, I will leave up to you. <laughs> yeah, sure, uh, good question. And yeah, I can I can kind of relate back to my equipment planning experience when we started uh, you know, working on departments and a lot of them were Kind of how the evolution's gone is you know we we saw a basic uh two zone department where you know you had the dirty and then clean and sterile processing or the sterile on on one side and that that was around for a long long time and i think that a lot of people um thought that uh that was a good design you had a big space in the in the clean work area and the sterilization area but as we as we you know kind of evolved in in the best practice and and when you have your infection control specialist in the hospital We've really str 
seeing it, you know, obviously drive to a three zone department. And that's some of the, the, the stuff that we've, I, I've seen kind of mature over the years. Um, a lot of the, we have a lot of old school architects though, that just are kind of out of touch with how that looks. And so when we get a lot of our designs in, um, they haven't evolved. And uh, so as an industry, keep have, teaching architects how to um, evolve and, and change on that, I think is, is something in our area that um, we need to keep po poking at and um, educating the architects because uh, sometimes they're just not kind of getting it right um, off the bat. But as that's kind of what I've seen, you know, obviously it's more linear flow. Uh, we've seen um, the SPD kind of move closer to the OR, sometimes on the OR floors. Uh, so we have a harmonious, um, you know, team environment. Um, those are just some of the same quick things I've seen kind of evolve over in my side of the woods. Nice, nice. And Shane, I'm going to kind of pose the same question to you, but can you give a little bit of, of, or add a little bit of color to the idea of functional design versus strategic design? Sure. Um, I think in the past it was, trying to shoehorn uh, sterile processing into a space without a lot of forethought, right? Um, here we have this space, uh, you know, and, and it's, if you think about the evolution of sterile processing, right, it's, it's, it's been a long time in the, in the works, right? So I think it was an afterthought at one point. I mean, hey, we do surgery. How do we do these instruments? You saw like tiny little setups of washers here and there, uh, maybe a sink here and there. And now what you're starting to see is, is some really good thought process into, hey, I need an efficient workflow where I'm not, you know, we're doing spaghetti diagrams, for example, to where we're watching how many times we cross paths to get to something. We're looking at how do we position a sink effectively. Um, we're also looking at how do we put the the proper equipment in the place that the operator is naturally going to go. So it's looking at that around the space that we have in an, in a, at least a renovation standpoint. Um, and then new construction is really kind of entirely different. We, we generally have a little more latitude, um, whereas we have to get a little more creative, I think on the uh, renovation side. Right. Mm, yeah. Hopefully absolutely. that answers. Really it does. You bring up a really great question. And, you know, I've talked to multiple over the years in sterile processing, I've talked to multiple sterile processing leaders who are sort of making do with the space that was given to them. And that idea of the sterile processing department being an afterthought rather than part of the strategic design going into a construction project is something that I'm sure a lot of folks, I'm seeing some reactions come through. I'm sure a lot of folks on this conference know the feeling of that, know the challenges um, associated with it. So that's a, a really great call out. What I would love to know from both of you, and either one of you can, can go first, but what are some insights on some of the current trends that you're seeing in department design and where does the need for innovation still exist? Jeff, do you want to take the first part and I can take the, the next innovation part? Yeah, yeah, sure. I mean, current trends. So part of our, my focus in, in my role is, is providing education to architects and, you know, we're trying to teach them about sterile processing design and really how their design um, can make or break a department. And a lot of the times and Shane and I over the years, we've gotten a lot of designs from the, the architects and you just look and you go, oh my goodness, what is going on here? And we have to, you know, fix it. <laughs> And so we've been trying to educate them on linear flows, work patterns, work in progress cues that have enough um, areas in, in the decon and in the clean. And we're starting to see them get it. They're, they know a, a linear flow, a three zone department is, is kind of, you know, becoming the standard. And um, so we're starting to see them evolve on that. They are getting that, but I think that's an education piece that we really need to push back on as as leaders in the industry on how we can um, best educate our architects on on that with current trends you know we're starting to see and a lot more of my designs i'm doing and working with we're starting to see obviously the immediate use sterilizers are being brought down into the spd they're being taken out of the or cores now some of the municipalities still have codes that are required to have those in a convenient area we're also starting to see um, scope processing being brought down into the SPD as well. So 
those our SPD professionals are highly educated and um, you know certified, and so we are seeing three zone departments, scope departments being brought down the SPD by the steel processing folks doing that. So you have a dirty, and then you have a pass through area where you'll have an endoscope reprocessor, and then it goes into a third zone where you might have a scope hanging cabinet, and then they're quarantining scopes, swabbing them, sending them out to the lab, making sure they're safe for patient use uh, going forward. Um, so that's kind of what I'm seeing in some of the current trends. Um, we're seeing um, upgrade in lighting in the SPD. You know, obviously that we don't do our do a very good justice of giving the technicians uh, the proper lighting. We're starting to see, um, obviously, if the department's not in the basement, um, we're we're giving view windows. You know, we don't want to close off the space and make someone feel like they're in a, a dark dungeon down there. So a lot of the forward thinking healthcare architects, you know, are really kind of, how can we make it a good patient experience, but not only that, but, you know, um, an employee um, experience. So colorful walls, um, upgrades in lighting, LED lighting, we're seeing um, non-slip floors, you know, we're getting rid of that VCT tile that's in there, it's dingy and gross, and going with maybe a port epoxy with some better um, slip resistant material. Uh, those are just, some of the newer stuff that I've been seeing that are being incorporated in, into uh, the current trends here. Yeah, Shane, before you get into the innovations, I just wanna uh, ask a couple of, of questions related to what you just said, Jeff. My The first question that popped into my mind when you said that you've seen a lot of architectural designs and just kind of rolled your eyes like, oh, here we go. What are yeah. some things that that immediately stand out when you're looking at a design from an architect that you're like, nope, this is not gonna work. We gotta go back to the drawing board. Yeah, good question. Thanks for that. Um, small inadequate space is what we're given. You know, the SPD doesn't gem geminate, uh, generate revenue. And so, you know, we try to educate these architects, hey, you've got a 20 OR facility. You might need about a 20,000, 15,000 square foot SPD. And then we get the design and it's 8,000 feet, 8,000 mm -hmm. square feet. And so when I look at these areas, I really, I just shudder my head and I have to push back that, you know, this is an adequate enough space. Um, you know, there's no rooms for EVS closets or they're shortchanging us on detergent rooms, vendor drop off, vendor pickup, you know, adequate sterile storage is another area that we see that is often cut short. And then in the, in the sterile storage, we're taking shortcuts and stacking wrap trays on top of each other that should not be done just because we don't have enough racking and storage space. So when I start seeing those, those are when I, I just start cringing and try to really become a subject expert, help these architects out and helping them do layouts and and provide an education on what works, what doesn't. So uh, yeah, that's, I mean, when I see those, we see it a lot and um, it's a challenge definitely in our, in our environment because we don't get enough adequate space. There's very little hospitals I've done a design on that um, have given me enough space. Interesting. So this is sort of butting another question in my in my mind. Are there architectural firms out there that typically work in the healthcare space that do get it? Or is it always an uphill battle from your perspective? No, there is. A lot of our your large healthcare studio places, your HOKs, Perkins Eastman's, your your big HDRs, you know, they 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 typically get it right. That is their domain and that is their, um, you know, space healthcare design. When we start getting into these medium sized firms, they might have, you know, a regional office in a state or two. Um, that's when we start seeing some challenges with designs just because maybe they do a lot of maybe municipality work, um, but they're starting to pick up healthcare work and they just haven't done a lot of it. So their experience level is, is um, short on it. Uh, mm -hmm. On some of these larger or the medium size, we're start. I'm starting to see architects employ nurses, SPD folks, maybe someone that's been involved in imaging as a subject matter to help them with the design. So we're starting to see some contract work. Mm -hmm. You know, maybe a retired um, scrub tech or a nurse has been around in the OR and is helping um, with that design. So they are employing them. They're starting to catch on that. You know, we need those subject experts. They are. They're. I mean, they know a little bit about a lot. And so they rely on the vendors and the subject matters to really make them um, shine in those areas. So that's mm -hmm. kind of what, what I'm seeing <clears throat> on that. Nice. 
Nice. My other question that that came to mind is you mentioned things like lighting and windows and slip resistant surfaces and colors and things of that nature. Is there a position that exists out there that essentially considers the human factor in all of these designs? Or is that just something that's sort of like weaving its way through all of these the architects and the, the vendor consultants that, that work with the architects and things of that nature? Or is that more of a formalized position that exists where they're starting to say, okay, we want our people to be comfortable. We want our mm -hmm. people to be able to work effectively. Here are the things to consider to make that happen. Yeah, I think that that comes with a lot of a lot of the large healthcare studios that we we you know I keep talking about. They have a lot of um, high end interior design folks that do help with those spaces. So you have your your basic architect that does your your core and shell, and then you have some specialized architects that do your interior fit up and and design. And we're start. I mean, there there's legitimately those types of positions that um, exist in a um, in a design studio that. Um, that people employ we also you know in the hospitals we have the ergonomic um component of it so we're you know we're starting to see a lot of like an ergonomics officer that's coming in and helping out with that layout um you know do we have great ergonomics just because of the workforce accidents that happen so you're starting to see those people work together on that to come up with a good um, solution and a design environment that you know doesn't make people want to run out the building and and cry it's so dark <laughs> Um, yeah, those do exist. Yeah. Nice, nice. Uh, it makes me think of the sterile processing department I worked in. It was, it was like basically almost floor to ceiling windows in decontam to the outside world, and it was just beautiful. It was on the fifth floor, and it didn't make you feel like you were in a cave all day. And I feel yeah. like just for employee morale, those types of things really make a big difference. Shane, I'd love to transition this conversation from the trends that you're seeing to what, where the need for innovation still exists. And maybe there are new innovations that you're seeing starting to become a trend. And maybe there are some that you're just dreaming up that you're like, this would be sweet. <laughs> These would be necessary. Yeah, uh, well, good, good question, Lindsay. I think from my standpoint, you know, technology wise, we're starting to see on Steam sterilizers in particular, uh, clean steam becoming more of a standard these days uh, in most discussions. So that's kind of encouraging. You get a better product as the, at the, by the use of it. Um, you know, so obviously with that comes a few complications of how do you make steam clean? <laughs> so, um, you know, you either put it in its own stainless steel generator with pure water or some form or fashion of that, or you exchange it through another generator of that form or fashion. So, um, so those are considerations that have to be accommodated often in the design. And, you know, where, where I, I like where Jeff was going from a aesthetic design, I think is, is becoming more and more important. I think we're starting to see institutions. They realize now that the healthcare workers, let's just face it. They're not coming back. Right. Um, so everywhere we go, we see or hear about staff shortages. So how do you make it a pleasant place to work? A lot of the things that Jeff was talking about are there um, where I'm really looking more involvement or getting more involvement in um, is something they've been doing in Europe for a number of years, and that's integrating robotics. Right. Um, mm -hmm. Bringing robots to the United States to supplement not take the position of somebody per se, but supplement and do do the, I would call a lot of them non-value added tasks, right? Loading and unloading of equipment that can be done with a machine like an AG, AGV, AMR, um, picking robots that can build uh, case carts and dispatch them. Um, these exist, right? So those are the things that I think you're gonna start to see in design you know, coming in the next five to 10 years for sure, um, if not sooner, based on the staffing issues we're seeing today. And in order to do that, they require space. <laughs> so um, we have to look at how they're implemented in those facilities and do we have the space to do it, right? Um, along with the need maybe for offsite reprocessing. And that's something that we've also seen an uptick in recently as well within the last few years. Mm -hmm. Something that comes to mind, just as you're talking about, you know, robotics and automation and things of that nature that already exists, 
in other, you know, other countries. Historically, there's been sort of a resistance to any sort of automation. And it's been sort of, I, I guess the best way to say it, it's been written off under the guise of it's going to remove positions um, from the department. Do you think, and this is maybe a, a philosophical question, but do you think that the the robots and the, the automation are better served in the early adopter facilities that are like up to date on the new technology, they're willing to give it a shot, or do you think that technology has a better place in the 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 facilities that are under resourced? And now if they're under resourced, they may not have a budget for something like this, but I can't help but wonder those facilities that are consistently understaffed, that are consistently under resourced, that would really be able to improve quality, efficiency, productivity by having these types of technologies implemented. Where do you think the disconnect is there? And where do you see that trend sort of coming, at least in the United States, where do you see that positioning itself first? Great question. Um, you know, I, I think automation has gotten a bad rap in the United States for a number of years, right? I, I think there was probably a sales pitch years ago about how this could maybe re replace someone, and that probably led to a distrust. And let's face it here in the United States, we're impatient people, right? It's, you know, a machine's going to take longer than somebody walking something over to a, a machine and, and putting it in. And I think you have the combined factors of maybe the way something was sold years ago versus the, the impatience factor that we generally have mm -hmm. here to, and, and trust, right? So we also have a trust issue on top of that where we don't trust the automation as well. So we are not going to trust that it's going to move fast enough and we then assist it and we, by assisting it, break it. <laughs> so, um, or, or at least get it out of sequence, right? Enough to where then it has to be reset. Like these are all the bad things about the way we've kind of presented it in the past, right? Um, and I think the, the means of looking at it from a quality perspective is really what the European communities looked at. They've not looked at it as saving FTEs. They've looked at it as how can I put my my FTEs in the right position from a quality perspective, because a 1% mm -hmm. increase in quality for them is huge, right? So if you think about the tasks that, that a human has to be involved in, the disassembly and cleaning in the sink is uber critical, right? Um, the assembly and, and prep and pack function is also uber critical. So by supplementing that, you know, to where they can focus on those primary tasks and get the ancillary stuff out of their way is really where the benefit is, right? It's focusing on how do I get a better product to the patient? And that in turn, hopefully translates to a better outcome, right? So mm -hmm. that's where I think robotics is is a key. Now, as far as understaffed, you know, and, and application, I don't know that there's a right answer. I think there's there's about a million different robots for a million different things, right? Um, I mean, if you look at uh, Amazon warehouses, the, these things drive all over and, and pick things up and operators put things in them. Um, they deliver them to their queuing stations on their own. Um, they're actually doing this in healthcare facilities as well, but typically on uh, maybe the pharmacy side of, of, of business uh, where they have heavy automation. And, and I, I think the other piece is, Let's, let's face it, SPD is a clinical factory, right? We have to understand the factory is a bad term for some reason in sterile processing, um, but really that's what it is. You're moving a widget from A to B to C to D, to, you know, to a finished good, right? So, and you're doing it over and over just like a factory does. So um, we just have to understand that it's a highly critical clinical factory and that's where I think you supplement where you can. Um, I think, you know, I'm certainly no expert in, in robots, at least yet. I'm learning. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we'll see where it goes because it, it's amazing what they can currently do. So if you think about the staffing shortages that we have, um, I don't know that this is an answer for everyone or every facility. But if you're planning a new facility, you should cer certainly be thinking about what the future looks like. Yeah, I, I'll add to Shane, you know, I just, I, I think when you mimic a repeatable process like stocking a sterile shelf or picking a case, you know, I think that's where the automation really 
is a great component. And that really, you know, it's a repeatable, you know, it's going to be exact when you have a robot. You know, I, I, people have asked me and someone asked me, uh, it was about three weeks ago, hey, you know, we, we see some robots and you've got these robots that bring the case cards down and dump them right by the SPD sink. You know, do you ever think the robots will replace our jobs? And, you know, I don't, I think there's some fear in that. And, you know, until the IFUs change or, you know, there's guidelines, we're always going to have that human element of inspection that needs to be done on the instrumentation. I don't think we're anywhere close with, you know, now you hear all the AI and stuff and maybe, you know, who knows what 20 years down the road will look like. Can a, a robot inspect and know if an instrument's clean or sharp or do a function test on it? You know, who knows? But I think what what Shane said, you know, on these repeatable things and stacking and we're starting to see them in uh, actually supply chain is using some robots too. So soft goods, you know, are being um, utilized with some robots. Uh, automated shuttle systems, uh, rotomats, uh, all kinds of good stuff that you know, are kind of starting to fall into the workplace. But I don't know if we're fully on there yet. That makes it not nice. quite. Not quite. <laughs> not quite. But yeah, uh, who knows? Awesome. Pretty yeah, I know. We'll have robots yeah. doing surgery soon, and you know, and the doctors will be put out of work. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I know the automation conversation was a bit of a tangent, but I think an important one as, as folks consider, I think you made a, a, that that one liner that you said, you know, if you're considering a, a construction project, understanding and kind of having some forethought into what the future holds is an important part of that discussion. Uh, and you're absolutely right. I'm curious, and Shane, I'm gonna toss this, this question over to you. Why and how do department designs most likely fail? And what are the implications of, of this type of failure? Uh, from my perspective, it's not having the right team that sticks up for what you know and believe in based on the data that's presented, right? Um, mm -hmm. So what I'm, and, and, and you kind of get into this from a, whether it be not like Jeff, Jeff's seen it, not enough space, right? Um, not fighting for space, not fighting for the right workflow, for example, like having equipment put in entirely incorrect positions because it would have cost maybe an extra $5,000 or $10,000 to move something mm -hmm. slightly, right? Those are, those are some of the things that I think really impact you because it not only impacts you then, it impacts you in the future, right? Because maybe it affects future expansion, right? Or it's also not thinking about growth. Like, do you have a growth plan? How do we factor that in? Are you going to be bringing robotics on? Maybe you're not doing robotics now. Like, these are all features or, or all things that impact the productivity of a, of a department and how you set it up. So um, I think those things are kind of uber critical and they manifest themselves usually with, you know, case delays you're purchasing if you're purchasing a lot of instrumentation something's broken in your process i'm telling you right now because <laughs> you should be pretty efficient at your process to get your trays through on a regular basis um you know and usually that's because if if you if you're purchasing a lot of extra you know ancillary instrument sets it generally has a root cause and you're just addressing um a symptom and not actually the the root cause of what the problem is, right? So that's where I see it. Yeah. Okay. Um, and Jeff, in terms of like mitigating these department designs that will most likely fail, how important is the location of the sterile processing department and the associated um, sections of it? How important is the location of it within a healthcare facility or does that not matter as long as the design of wherever it is is a good design. Yeah, good, good, good point. Um, I, I think first and foremost, the design of the department is critical as number one in retrospect to the location. Um, you know, when we start seeing, like I said earlier, you know, we're starting to see the SPD on the same floors as the surgical suites. That presents challenges because obviously we have some equipment that's in a pit and uh, the, the, the floors, you know, aren't conductive to having pits unless it's in the basement floor or on the ground floor. So we see some challenges on, on that in terms of the location. Um, I think what, if you do have them in different locations or different floors, having um, designated 
transport elevators for the instrumentation, both clean and dirty separate elevators is, is pretty important. And, you know, we see some of these designs that come from uh, architects where they have the SPD and it's great. The, the, the elevator comes out great. There's sterile core, it's beautiful and everything. And the, but when it comes down to the SPD, it's pinched in a corner. The case carts have nowhere to go. You got 30 case carts stuck in a corner because the elevator uh, dumps out on the wrong location or it doesn't point in the right direction, right? That can affect the whole workflow. So when we see them on different floors, I'm always trying to look at, you know, like an elevator plan, see how that kind of interacts. I mean, we've made some suggestions and changes if you get it on early in the design, uh, there's not much implication in, in design changes, you know, to maybe move an elevator or turn it, you know, to be an ultimate um, in the department for a better workflow. But, um, you know, I don't think it's too important. I, I like the holistic design of the SPD and the OR on one floor just because of the team work environment. It's, it's quick. If someone needs something, they can get the instrumentation there a little bit quicker. Your SPDs are typically managed by a periop director, which you know oversees um, both. So I think that that kind of makes every, it it keeps separation of the um, at bay and makes it more of a teamwork and a fostered environment that you know is for best outcomes. I think so. Hope that answers your question. Yeah, it absolutely does. What I would love to do now is sort of take a look at the layout considerations for optimized workflow in the different areas of sterile processing. And let's start with decontam. What yeah. are, from your both of your perspectives, what are some layout considerations that are really critical for optimization in that specific area of sterile processing? You want Jeff, you want to get on this one? Yeah, I'll yeah. stop. I'll yeah. Decontamination, so whenever we do site walks, um, the, the the decontam is my like number one hot button in the, in a sterile processing design because that's the first place where we're decanting instruments. You get a decontamination area wrong, it's going to affect every part of the component of the processing steps. And so, when I look at decontam area, you know, space is always my first consideration. Do we have enough during rush hour in the SPD? Do we have enough laydown area for the case carts to be stored? You know, are we I walk into a department, if I see case carts outside of the decontam door, we've got a problem, right? I mean, they're lined up <laughs> down the hallway and, and typically a public course, not always public, but um, that's my number one red flag. So when I really work, decontamination is important. Do we have um, linear flow from the sinks? Do the sinks line up and are they in retrospect really easy for in front of the washers? So we, we always try to, when I do my designs, you know, we, Enough lay down space in the decontam is important. Do we have an EVS closet if that's required by code? Do we have a vendor drop off area? That's always another one of my my hot buttons because when I walk in sometimes the back doors and I see <laughs> instrumentation just laying out in a at the dock or the warehouse. You know we obviously don't have enough you know a, a storage space efficient for vendor sets. So that's something I'm always looking at um, in the decontam. But make sure we just have a nice linear flow. Do my sinks always work towards the uh, ultrasonic from the ultrasonic do we work towards the washers and we don't have too many travel steps uh, we can do quite a bit in in a small de decontam area if the workflow is efficient and works you know always more towards a linear fashion so those are some of the things on the decon decontam that i always look for in, in design work that are important i feel important in the industry to make a better work workflow out of that area nice and Shane, maybe I'll toss this next area to you. How about, let's talk about prep and pack. Uh, what considerations should folks consider um, for optimized workflow in that area? Uh, you know, I think in the prep and pack area, it's about having, you know, adequate workspaces, right? Um, do you have, you know, places to have your wrap stations, for example? I mean, I know everybody tries to get into the height adjustable tables, which are fantastic, you know, ergonomic, uh, you can store a lot of things on the shelves and things like that that are on the back side of it. Um, I think we've seen where you can have wrap spools for your blue wrap, uh, but that only accommodates you a certain, uh, you know, a certain way, uh, or with a certain size. I would say you have limitations there. So you know, we're, I don't know that anybody's ever going to get away from from blue wrap. It's nice to think about, but containerizing is pretty expensive, right? Um, not to say it's not probably the way we should eventually go, but 
there's a lot of sets out there and a lot of facilities that uh, are going to need blue wrap for a long time. So it's it's knowing where to locate that, knowing where to maybe have an additional wrapping table if you actually need it, um, because sometimes those work surfaces on those height adjustable tables get pretty pretty cluttered. Um, it's also having maybe some designated areas. When you look at really streamlined production, it's about have, being repeatable. Jeff, I think, mentioned it on you know an earlier part of the discussion. It's repeatable processes. And when you start to do very different things all over the place, you become a little bit inefficient. So I think we're seeing you know a setup of maybe a low temp area that's a low temp lane that starts from decontam, if you have that ability, mm -hmm. and it extends through the prep and pack area and and into its own low temp sterilization area, for example, right? Um, and it would be no different on the high temp side, right? Which would be the rest of your department for the most part. So um, yeah. I think those are the biggies, right? And, and being able to accommodate all the extra goodies that end up invariably ending up in your department, right? Um, you know, it's all nice and great when you see this architectural design and then you forgot about, oh, geez, I need five of these and 10 of those and six of these. And now I've got six sterilizer racks here. You know, what, what do I do? <laughs> How can I maneuver? Right. Um, those are kind of the things that we look at when we look at the space to go. How can we best position these tables? What's going to go at the end of those tables? Where do our sterilizer racks go? Knowing that we need X amount of them based on how many we have. Um, you know, that that's kind of my my hot button, I would say. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. And when we talk about sterilizer racks, let's also transition to the sterilization and cooling area. Um, and, you know, what implications are there? Because obviously what comes out, what goes in must come out. Uh, not all departments mm -hmm. have those pass through sterilizers that are awesome. Um, and so talk talk a little bit or dwell a little bit more on on those implications. Yeah, well, I'll, you should definitely. Take, yeah, you want to go, Jeff? Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Go ahead. I, I, there, one of my my big hot buttons, and I always ask the architect or the engineers that are on the project, "Can I see your HVAC plan?" And one of the things that drives me absolutely in um, bananas is when we have HVAC supply registers right over the front of the sterilizers because they need to provide cooling in the building. But now we have a hot sterilizer load. Cold air is being blown down on the hot sterilizer load, and now we're going to have potential condensation, which means a wet pack, which means we're going to have to redo the whole whole load. So, the, the, in the sterilization kind of cooling area, that's those are really important to me when I when I look at, especially if that's a, like a sing, um, a two zone department. Um, I'm always looking for that. Um, on my three zone departments, um, we just I just recently did a couple of projects out here on the west where um, we have a pass through sterilizer but we made a separate quarantine area for the sterilization um, racks. So they come out of a door and then we created a glass window type with double doors where it's kind of like a holding and quarantine area that is a little bit more temperature controlled and more sensitive. So we can hold the temperature, get them cooling in, a, in the proper fashion, um, but not introducing any of that cold air through the HVAC. So it's kind of one extra little step that we've seen. I thought it was pretty ingenious um, and it kind of keeps some some of the badge control is done so we don't have, you know, reps coming out of the OR grabbing on sterile instruments or, or not looking at it, make sure everything passed before they can just come and grab something. So I thought that was, the, on that part, that was kind of innovative. And, you know, I've, I might incorporate that into some of the stuff I've been working on. Um, we, we don't always get enough cooling, right? So you talk about sterilization. Sure, we have uh, six sterilizers sitting in front, but where do you, do you have an, a sufficient area to lay down and park those carts? So. You know, Shane alluded to, you know, yeah, we can put a sterilizer and we have our core equipment in there, but there's so many ancillary things that go on, um, cabinets, casework, you know, whatever it might have you, but having enough lay down area for that. And then future growth, uh, Shane talked about earlier about, you know, how do we future proof a department? A lot of the times I see if we have adequate wall space in the sterilization cooling area, I always try to recommend at least shelling out or putting a, a, a wall plug in. So if our case volumes increase, you know, 10% over the next five or something years, we can slap a new sterilizer in, take the fake wall panel out and off the run. And so trying to f uh, future proof the department, you know, not only the prep and pack and when we talked about decontam, but do we have enough, if we have wall space, can we add future equipment? Just because we know that uh, uh, surgeries drive revenue and the more surgeries and more revenue the hospital makes. So that's kind of some of the stuff yeah. I, considerations I look for on the sterile and, and cooling area. Nice. 
nice. And then obviously the other the other section, the storage and distribution considerations um, that should be taken when you're designing that area of the department. And when I say, you know, storage is a challenge for a lot of facilities, I'm sure everyone's doing the same thing you guys are doing, which is <laughs> nodding your heads yes. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, Jeff, when you when you work with architects to ensure adequate sterile sterile storage, is that even a thing? And how can someone plan for growth and keep growth considerations in mind after laying that initial concept down? Yeah, yeah, that that preside that, that's a big challenge. Even you know we we can look at a space and and identify it, but just as you alluded to about the the growth. I, I, we look at spaces and, you know, I go, okay, that's great. But then it comes, we talk about sterile storage. What kind of rack systems do they have? Do they have a Belenter? Do they have a wired rack shelf system? What, you know, what kind of areas? Because some of these, we might be deficient in size, but you can come up with some innovative storage solutions that make a small place actually have uh, quite a considerable amount of sterile storage area. So. You know what I, I ask? It's hard to always ask an architect. They're not going to know what kind of racking system they're going to put. They might park in, you know, one of those submarine type. Let's slide the door back and forth, you know, as, as kind of a placeholder. But when you really dive down into it, I think that the uh, those types of ster uh, sterile storage folks should work more with the architects to kind of help them develop those types of areas. Um, if I do see an adequate, inadequate small space, you know, I always ask the architect, is there something we can compromise on? Can we get a little bit more? Because that's you know that's typically where we we see decontam short sterile storage is typical short in coming from an architect so I always try to push back on that and see if we can get anything bigger um, and work with that it, it's hard though it's really hard when you know the architect is reluctant and say well we don't have any more you know we need all these air uh, support areas you know what can we do the the other thing that you know we look at is okay we might have an immediate sterile storage um, need down on the spd but what does my sterile core look like are we housing anything up in large sterile cores and we're kind of see that you know i i have my thoughts about you know having sterile storage in two different areas just because of i think the efficiencies on it you got to transport the transport cart up there or the case cart you know pick from two different locations so if we don't have anything small, if I look at the SPD, I always go back to the architect, say, where, where, what's your sterile core look like and what are we housing in there? Uh, and then try to identify some space in that. That's kind of where we get. Okay. The audience is showing you some love on that one. <laughs> That's <laughs> for sure. <laughs> Seeing some reactions come through. Well, you know, that, that um, we talked about earlier, obviously, the, the, the double stacking, triple stacking of the blue wrap trays, which is a no-no, you know, but it's a Band-Aid and... You know, joint, I, joint Commission is really hammering down on that. We're starting to see that. They're, they're starting to really get keen on, you know, what Amy recommends, what are some of the guidelines, and they're starting to, you know, really poke around in that that type of space. And, and uh, I do know some spaces that have gotten busted for that, having those double stacks. So they are starting to get inquisitive, and, you know, we may do, need to do the right thing so that we can pass joint inspections or JCO or whoever your regulatory body might be. And, uh, you know, I just wish there was better guidelines. There's really no... When I think about architects call me and say, well, how much square footage do I need? And I said, well, you don't have a guideline. And there's really not an industry guideline on if I have five ORs, six ORs, what is my mm -hmm. SPD look like? You know, we, we work with some templates in our, in our system here and say, you know, we have this, this many ORs. Um, this is maybe what your SPD square footage should be. Now you give that to an architect and, you know, there was 10,000 square foot on it and they, Put it down to seven, but you know, there's you think of some there's some <laughs> local IBMs that are really sharp on their space planning, and they'll say, hey, we've got these many ORs. They start plugging them into calculators. It's going to say, I need the, an EVS size, I need uh, an SPD this size, and I think some of those forward-thinking hospital chains are, are getting it right and identifying um, when they're doing their space planning um, how that might work with with variables that are plugged in and so i wish architects did that a little bit better or had some kind of guidelines there's really i looked through you know the fgi all kinds of stuff there's really not a guideline for that and i think if we had some standardized guidelines across the board we, we would get spd sizing mm -hmm. a little bit better uh down the road so yeah. those are just some of my observations like i noticed in that that you know hopefully 
can help down the road if we ever come up with some something like that. You know, we have guidelines for everything else, but not really size. So who would you put on that task force in the industry <laughs> to develop those guidelines? That's, that's Dude, my question. I mean, I would love to be, I mean, I love, to be, I love discussing, you know, what part of my, the, my passion and joy is, is working with the architect team and, you know, really looking at, at design and, and seeing a square box. You know, when, you know, I, some of the different levels of the architects, you know, we, they start doing a stocking, stacking diagram or through this rectangle stack, you know, we're going to have a seven story hospital and they're just stack, stack, stack. So they give an allocation of space and then they start working, um, you know, plan down view and just seeing that stuff come to fruition and um, is what I enjoy. You know, I wouldn't mind being on that. I'm sure, you know, a bunch of different other regulatory bodies an SPD, you know, task force, um, some of your um, AORN folks, you know, It'd probably be good as an industry to come together on what might be a reasonable guideline, I think. Right. Absolutely. Interesting. Okay. Well, you know, one thing that I'm noticing through all these sessions today is there are a lot of really, really cool action items and opportunities that are coming out of these discussions. This is going on the list. I don't know how Beyond Clean can be a part of it, but I know we want to, and so <laughs> more to come <laughs> on that. And if you're sitting in the audience and you're like, heck yes, this is interesting to me. This is something that we need. Uh, connect with us. Uh, we'd love to just keep the conversation going. Um, with our final 15 minutes that we have left, which I can't believe we only have 15 minutes left, I wanna spend a little bit of time talking about renovation versus new construction. Um, because I know, I'm, I'm sure folks who are tuned in right now and folks who will watch this on demand have likely lived through both of those things. And our team at Beyond Clean recently did a, a pretty cool video with a department out in New Jersey where the sterile processing leadership team was very, very much a part of the design process. Um, very much a part of giving their recommendations based on what they know that their department needs, what they know their staff needs, and what they know their their you know, the output of their department needs. What are some challenges in your mind? And Shane, maybe I'll toss this one to you. What are some challenges and conversely, what are some opportunities in renovating existing departments? We'll talk about that first before we get into new construction. That's a good one. Jeff and I were actually uh, commiserating over this yesterday about another project we were working <laughs> Great. on. And, um, you know, unfortunately, when you're in a renovation, you're still working there. <laughs> so figuring out how to keep the department running uh, is kind of critical. You know, there's obviously companies out there that can provide an, an outsourced SPD. Um, in, some, in some areas, there's actually uh, offsite SPD um, facilities you can contract with. They'll sterile, they'll come pick up your goods, they'll wash them, they'll sterilize them, et cetera, while you go through that. There's other companies that are out there that'll bring in a mobile SPD and stick it in your parking lot. And then you just figure out passive egress in and out. Um, invariably, those are built on a tractor trailer platform. They're very tight, you know, so you're, 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 putting a lot of stress on your department by, you know, by either one of these scenarios. And, um, you know, the other part is the infrastructure on a renovation. It already exists. So the things that you get into, it's kind of like renovating an old house. You know, you open up a wall and you go, uh oh, <laughs> you know, uh, our project timeline that was supposed to take three days now takes two weeks. Right. Um, or something of that nature. Right. Like, I think the pro that's the problem with renovations. Right. You're trying to work around what you have. You have there's there are solutions out there. Are they the best for your facility? I think that's for you and your vendors to really decide along with your staff of how that could work. But it's also about proper planning. Right. Is it uh, can you plan something like this during when you know your schedule is going to be lighter than usual? Right. Um, you know, and it also puts a lot of stress on staff. You know, there's machines down. They still have the same demands. Um, you know, they're getting the nasty calls from the OR. Where's my stuff at? Um, you know, they're, they're, you, you really feel some compassion for these guys having to work in, in these conditions. Right. Whereas new construction. Well, that's where everybody wants to be. <laughs> right. A little less, a <laughs> little less stressful than that. So. Hopefully that answered right. your question. 
It does, yeah. And, you know, I'm curious, Jeff, since you put together a lot of these designs or you work with the architectural firms, just from a, to just a purely, like, I geek out perspective, do you geek out more on brand new designs or on trying to make a, an existing design like so much better? Which do you prefer? Uh, I know you're doing it both, but which do you prefer? <laughs> uh, obviously new construction, just because of it's easy. And you're designing from scratch, so you can put all the latest and greatest and come up with walls and designs and layouts that are, you know, are very efficient. Um, to be candid, I mean, I have a general contractor background and some of these renovations I get off, I, I enjoy because um, it's a challenge and I, I'm up for the challenge on how are we going to elaborately phase a program, keep them running, are we going to work at night or, or the daytime, but I love seeing, um, it's hard and if you're in like in California where you have Oshpod, I mean if we're trying to increment, submit these into Oshpod in different increments, they're tough, they're going to want to see every phase detail going in there. So. Those ones. Can you uh, can you add context in case someone hasn't heard of Oshpod before? Yeah, Oshpod is a, a regulatory body in California because of all the seismic activity that they have out there. There's a lot of building codes that are stringent that um, Oshpod adopts, and so you have shake tables, you have seismic anchoring, so the equipment doesn't tip over. But they're almost like um, I, I call them like a mafia environment. They, they've held up projects in hospitals, even though the regulatory body will approve it, but Oshpot hasn't approved mm -hmm. it. They, they have a whole completely different way of how they approve projects. And so it creates a very challenging environment where some of our, you, you build on the East Coast, you submit it to the local building code and they, they look at it and, and approve it. We have projects in California that, you know, are a year and a half, two years in the making before we even start construction. So some of these wow. cycles are a lot longer uh, on the new construction. So that makes it a little bit challenging in, and especially in a renovation. Now with renovations, um, you start, maybe the building was built 20 years ago, but now you're going to renovate it. And now they're going to, you know, you might have a small renovation project that's turned into a major renovation because they're going to make you come code compliant with the new IRC codes, IBC codes, the plumbing codes coming up. So your little half a million dollar renovation could be 1.5 now because you're going to bring all the electrical up to code. So it presents challenges. I like those challenges because I think there's some unique, when I work on projects, you know, we'll have these planning sessions and really have the mechanical electrical plumbing engineers working with the architects on how we can, how we can do this, how we can make walls work, how can we keep infection control containment barriers alive. So those are fun. They're hard and complex, you know, more versus new, but you know, new is always sexy, clean, you know, new, new environment, but <laughs> I like them both, um, sure. you know, a challenge for each. Yeah, absolutely. You brought up a great segue into another question that I have for you. And, and that's how design influences infection control and sterilization effectiveness. Um, can you speak a little bit to that? Because obviously, I mean, design impacts a lot of things, but specifically, how does it impact the ability to maintain those infection control practices? Yeah, I think I think really where the infection control component of it comes in is is on renovations. And how do we keep, you know, our air exchanges in check? How do we keep, you know, positive and, and negative pressure? How are we mitigating um, I mean, there's sometimes we have workarounds where uh, case carts are leaving in a dirty environment after they've been picked. You know, maybe we, we have to shut down part of the mm -hmm. sterile storage or, or a method to get up. Maybe we're doing um, an elevator repair or replacement. So um, we work with quite a bit of the infection control people that are on staff on how we're going to, they always want to plan of how we're going to keep sterility, how we're going to keep hazardous materials at bay. And so working with them, they're, they per, they're really experts. I enjoy working with them because they come up with some forward thinking ideas on how we can keep some of this mitigated during a, a renovation or, or a project. Mm -hmm. And they have a lot of input on containment barriers and, and um, access. Um, some of them are pretty highly knowledgeable in that, in that space. So it, it New construction, obviously, it's not. We don't hear too much of infection control people, but it's really the the remodels that where we have 
quite a bit of uh, influence or they have a lot of influence on how the mm -hmm. policy works. Sure, sure. But answer your question Shane, on that one. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think, you know, when we talk about the impact of design and the influence of of design on department outcomes. Shane, I'm going to toss this one to you. What about the impact of good design or bad design on operating room customers and surgeon satisfaction? Does design play a role in maintaining those relationships? Well, sure. I mean, if your if your design is poor, depending upon where it's at, invariably you're affecting a part of your function, right? So uh, I, I know Jeff and I have uh, I feel like I've been in hundreds of sterile processing departments across the country and, and it's amazing what occurs in some of them, right? Um, you can see why things are lost or things, why things aren't done properly because, you know, they aren't laid out correctly. Um, they aren't organized correctly. So, uh, I mean, I think back, there's a facility I visited a number of years ago where their storage, Jeff, to your point, their sterile storage, their entire SPD was in their OR. And um, their OR core kind of kicked out into like the, you know, I'd say their OR, OR core connected to the actual clean side of the department. And, you know, you had cross traffic from people all day long coming in and out. I need instruments. And they'd take the instruments and there would be no, you know, <laughs> there would be no, no way for them to get, you know, to, to keep track of them. And then they had three different sterile storage areas for their instrumentation that were not even remotely close. They were, you know, one was on one side of the hall on one side of the, the OR department and the other two were on another side. And, and, you know, then you looked at their core and how they were doing things. And so, I, you know, I can see how it impacted. The surgeons were unhappy. The people were unhappy. The workers in SPD couldn't get anything done because people kept coming in and interrupting what they were doing all the time. So um, that's a that's a classic workflow problem right there. Yeah. So hopefully that answers that question. I'll, I'll add a little bit, Shane, on that one. Just, uh, you know, you, you talked earlier on the clean steam component and, you know, the, the steam quality is only as good as the additives that go in the boiler. And uh, I think when we're doing new designs, I have a new project we're working on that we're, we're trying to do a, a clean steam solution in. And on renovations, it's important, you know, maybe the steam system was good, if they need to replace the boilers, but you look at some of these hospitals that have um, old, old pipes and they start rusting inside. So the steam, the specks of mm -hmm. rust get on the instruments. Dr. Smith is up there operating on, on Billy Joe and looks at the instrument and he throws it because he thinks there's blood on it and it's not, it's really just a bad environment of, of the building infrastructure. So when we're getting these designs, you know, um, on some of these older hospitals, we can mitigate some of that with, with clean steam solutions. That's cost, the, the clean steam's caustic in nature, makes the instruments more shiny, removes all the impurities out of there and really just helps better with pitting and staining. I think that gives us, you know, if we, we get that right, the, the surgeon is more satisfied. You know, God, my instruments look great. They're shiny. I don't see any, in, you know, anything wrong with them. And so when we, I think that's important when we're designing, we always try to influence that on, and I think that just makes it staffs easier. The instruments are cleaner, surgeon loves it. Um, so I think we, as a, as a, a whole, we should advocate more on um, doing clean steam and in our design work. I think it just benefits everyone yeah. across the board. Yeah, and you know, it, there's always that moment as a sterile processing tech where you get a new shiny piece of equipment and you're like, oh, this is this is this is the life, right? This is the life. It's like you feel proud to yeah. use it. You feel proud of what it does, um, and surgeons likely feel the same way when they are able to use those, you know, instruments that look good. Probably make them feel good using them, and so there's there's really not a lot of difference there. Um, so thank you for for expanding on that. Um, we only have about a minute left on this. Is there anything that you either of you want to share with the audience? Obviously, we could talk about. <laughs> I mean, I could talk about department design and pick your guys's brain for another hour, uh, but we do have another session after this. So, um, is there anything that, in terms of department design, in terms of of the sketch, in terms of new construction or reconstruction? 
anything that you want to leave the audience with just as kind of a takeaway. And obviously, you know, your contact information is on the screen in the speaker bio tool. So anyone who wants to reach out to either of you can do so. Uh, and please, audience, feel free to do so because they're obviously a wealth of knowledge. But what would you leave the audience with? Just one takeaway. Uh, from my perspective, hmm, that's a good one. I would say this, you only typically get one shot at renovating. Stick up for yourself, do it right. Press for what you need, get the resources. Um, your vendors are there, they should be there to help you. Um, we have a number of tools and, and things to do that. So, um, you know, help build the case of why you should do it and, you know, build the business case, right? That's, that's my takeaway, I think. That'll be Jeff, our next yours? session, Shane. Yeah. <laughs> How to build a business case for renovation. Yeah, I like it. <laughs> Stay tuned, everybody. <laughs> Jeff, what about you? Yeah, um, I think from my my biggest takeaway in in doing the design and everything is is um, education and importance to the the architect team. And that is really just, you know, teaching them, you know, how the SPD works. Um, whenever I try to do education lessons, I try to bring in videos and show them how everything kind of works. So they can kind of get a real sense of, oh, I need this much space for lay down equipment. I need to put my, my instruments here. And I, and I think, you know, as I go, it, it builds us credibility as experts when we can help the architect team really get it right. And, you know, it, it's important. That's one of my bigger, biggest pet peeves and, and things I strive for is the education lessons like we provide here, but to the architect team as well, just so they help get it right. Um, we take equipment planners out too um, and do site visits. You know, we do an education lesson and walk them through an SPD and, and because, you know, they're instrumental too in, in helping influence some of these things with as we go through the vendor selection and a lot of the equipment planners do equipment layouts. Um, and so really helping understand how the process works and why doing something um, can negatively impact the design or the flow is, is what I'm passionate about. So I always try to speak about that. And that's one of my big takeaways in, in SPD design. Awesome. Thank you so much for those takeaways. Anyone who's curious and interested in talking more, if you have an upcoming renovation or a new department design, you know, down the pipeline, definitely reach out to Jeff and Shane. They're clearly a wealth of knowledge and can talk you through um, everything that you need to set yourselves up for success and your hospital up for success. Both of you, thank you so much for spending your afternoon with me. It's been a pleasure talking with you about this. We're excited to have you back for future sessions on, on the Beyond Clean platform. For all of you tuning in to this discussion, thank you for sticking with us today. We have one session left in today's Operation Optimize conference. We're grateful for your time. We know that it's a it. We know how much it means to us that you're here with us, and we know um, the dedication that you have to educating yourself and doing what's right for your department. So thank you for being here. We'll see you in a couple minutes for the final session of Operation Optimize. Thank you, Thanks, everyone. Jose. Thanks all.